This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less tax. Mm. Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of Wealth Ability. So inflation is supposedly on the downturn here. Is it really? Is it going to continue? And what can we do about it? We have um, an expert on this topic, David Stockman, former budget director for Ronald Reagan and uh, Washington Insider and uh, Wall Street Insider. Um, who's, David, you've just written a new book. So tell us a little bit about uh, why you wrote this book and what you're looking at here. Well, the title is The Great Money Bubble. So I think that links pretty clearly uh, to your point about uh, inflation. But uh, the uh, theme of the book is inflation didn't just uh, appear in the last year or 12 months. It's not peaked. It's not going away rapidly. But to the contrary, Federal Reserve policy, and then on top of that, the borrow and spend policies of Congress have built in an inflationary tidal wave that I think is going to last for quite a while and will require some very draconian monetary restraint by the Fed uh, to bring it to heel. So the uh, theme of the book is how did we get here? 30 years of history, not three months or uh, a year of uh, argument about Fed policy. The answer is just go to the point when Alan Greenspan became Fed chairman. Some people may remember that. It was August 1987. If we look at the balance sheet of the Fed, which basically is a measure of how much money it's printed over time, kind of the cumulative print, if you want to put it that way, it was 200 billion and the GDP was 5 trillion. Eh, kind of the historic ratio of Fed balance sheet, a few percent of GDP. Now, here we are a uh, little more than 30 years later. The balance sheet of the Fed peaked uh, recently at $9 trillion, and the GDP uh, was only $25 trillion. To, to reduce it down, the Fed's balance sheet grew by 45-fold during that three-decade period, whereas the GDP increased by only five-fold. Now, I think if people think about uh, that proposition, that the balance sheet of the Fed, the money that they're printing and injecting into the economy, grew nine times faster than the GDP, and not for a month or two months or two years, but for more than three decades, then you can see that something is badly out of balance and why we've built in this huge inflationary bubble that first uh, ended up in the financial markets uh, with stock uh, prices and bond prices being inflated way beyond their sustainable levels, then, uh, th then uh, basically worked its way into the global economy and finally came roaring back uh, to the US when the supply chain broke down uh, owing to the COVID disruption. So that's how we got here. And uh, until the Fed fundamentally changes its ways and Washington starts to uh, embrace prudent economics, we're going to have one economic crisis, in my view, after another. Well, uh, if we can, let's break yeah. this down a little bit Okay. Um, for our listeners. Our listeners are primarily uh, entrepreneurs and investors here. So sure. um, not economists. And so, right. so help us understand what impact, why does the Fed's balance sheet, so this is money that the Fed's created, right? They've actually right. Yeah. Um, put this money on their balance sheet. They just kind of printed the money, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why is that have such a big, why do you think that has such a big impact on inflation and why are, why aren't we seeing greater inflation if it does have such a big impact? Well, it has a big impact, but it works through uh, the financial markets with a lag. And uh, the point that I'm making is that when the Fed increases its balance sheet by more than almost $9 trillion, 
it's essentially injecting nine trillion of demand into the world economy with no additional supply. And so demand and supply gets way out of balance and pretty soon it ends up in rising prices. But in the initial instance, uh, this massive uh, fiat credit produced by the Fed never left the canyons of Wall Street. It got absorbed by uh, speculators and traders and leveraged uh, 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 arbitrage artists who uh, took that cheap money that the Fed was injecting into the financial markets, used it to buy assets that were appreciating and thought they were going to live happily ever after. Now, that's why, for instance, if we look at the crisis in 2007 and 8, if we look at the growth of the Fed, uh, I mean, growth of the stock market, and I use the uh, NASDAQ 100 as kind of a uh, uh, benchmark, because it's the, really the leading edge of the stock market of the big tech companies of the growth sector, so-called. From the bottom in December 2008 uh, to the high uh, early uh, in 2022, the NASDAQ 100 rose by 1,250%. During the same period, the GDP rose by 55%. Now, again, you have to go to basic economics 101. It doesn't require, you know, a PhD in economics to question whether the economy can, uh, I mean, whether the stock market can sustainably grow, you know, for a 23 times faster over nearly a decade or more than a decade uh, than the GDP. Because remember, the GDP is just a proxy for the wages, salaries, and profits that are being generated by the American people. And how in the world uh, can you have 23 times more value in the stock market than you have uh, wages, salaries, profits, and output in the mainstream economy? You can't. So again, that's another measure of how the inflation occurred, this time in financial assets. Yeah, so so let's talk about that difference because we have we have um, price inflation, yeah. um, uh, asset inflation, asset right. inflation, which we've seen in the housing market, we've seen in in uh, in the stock market, we've seen in asset prices generally. Um, we haven't seen it until recently in in um, consumer goods. So right. why why has it taken so long for there to be um, any kind of significant inflation yeah. in consumer goods. And why is that inflation coming down? Okay. Um, first of all, I'm not sure the inflation is coming down. You, you're looking at short-term uh, movements in the, uh, let's say, the CPI. But what I did recently in the uh, newsletter that I post every day was to say, wait a minute, let's look what happened in, in from the spring of 2021 through uh, early 2022 to commodity prices and manufacturing uh, components of the CPI versus services. And maybe we've got some uh, perturbations in there that we need to look through. And so what I did was take the rate of CPI increase on a two-year stacked basis. And what I mean by that is we go back two years and look at the annual rate of growth between, uh, let's say, uh, December uh, 2022 and December 20, uh, and write that down, and then do that for November and October and so forth. What we find is that the CPI on a two-year trend basis, where we took out some of this extreme uh, whipsawing, uh, yo-yoing, as I call it, uh, never rose at 9%, it, as they say it did in June, the one-year rate, at a little under 7%. And by December, it was still rising at 7%. In other words, what the two-year stacked analysis shows is that inflation is pretty much plateaued around 7%, but notwithstanding the Fed raising the interest rate from essentially zero uh, to 4%, uh, the inflation rate is now plateauing at a unsustainable 7%. You can't have 7% inflation year in and year out and have, for instance, uh, 
the 10 year treasury this very moment trading at 3.5%. I mean, what kind of uh, sense does that make? Uh, that's a negative, almost a negative 4% real yield. So uh, basically, the Fed is not nearly done raising rates. It's going to take much higher rates uh, to bring this inflation to heel. It's not coming down uh, if you really look at the underlying trend of the numbers. And it's going to take a pretty rip-roaring uh, recession in 2023, maybe into 2024, to finally bring it to heel because the Fed uh, is not uh, nearly done. That's my first point. The second point so, is- so, so let me let me stop you there just yeah. for a second, David. So um, the market seemed to think that the Fed's almost done because well, they're, right, they're pricing in, uh, you know, we don't have a tumble in the stock market right now. Um, and they're, 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 they're thinking that the, that the yeah. Fed's not going to continue raising rates aggressively. How high do you see the Fed needing to raise rates in order to bring that inflation back down to that 2% range? I would say 7 to 8% or maybe more. And yeah. I base it on my experience in the late 70s when I was a member of Congress and then the Reagan administration when I was budget director beginning in 81 and what Volcker had to do uh, to bring inflation to heel back then. When he became Fed chairman out of desperation, Jimmy Carter was desperate, inflation was in double digits he, in 1979. So he became chairman right. uh, in August, 1979. If you look at the real rate on the treasury, 10-year uh, treasury, when he became Fed chairman, it was negative 2%. In other words, inflation was running 10, uh, the yield was eight, was negative 2%. He had to raise rates for the next 24 to 30 months continuously and aggressively until he got the real rate from negative two to positive nine. I mean, that is that is a wow. huge, if, if you had to do that today, it would imply, you know, uh, a, a treasury rate of around 15%. Well, I'm not predicting that or suggesting it's necessary. But what I am suggesting was the fundamental truth that Paul Volcker operated on and got people finally to understand in the early 80s was you can't break the back of inflation and the speculation that underlies it if you have negative real rates. You've got to have strongly positive real rates. Now, where are we today? Well, I just said, you know, inflation is still running on a trend basis, 7%. The Treasury 10-year uh, uh, bond, the benchmark for the entire system is three and a half. That's negative three and a half. They've got a long way to go to get to, to, to the Volcker standard. And so therefore, the market, uh, you know, the market is always right in the moment, except it changes its mind every three seconds. So the point I want to make here is the market has been pricing in the great Fed pivot over and over and over since the market peaked in January 2022. And the pivot keeps getting deferred in time as the facts become more apparent. And as even the Fed heads uh, put out their uh, missives, missives and speeches, warning people, don't think that we're going to pivot tomorrow. And the markets can't seem to, you know, let go of that uh, theme because, and here's the reason, and it goes back to the fundamental point of my book, The 30 Years of Money Printing, it, the market has been house trained to think that the Fed will never allow financial markets to normalize, interest rates to normalize, or the stock market to correct uh, seriously and sustainably. And so therefore, they keep making up excuses for why the Fed is almost done and about ready to pivot to rate reductions. Of course, that's all priced in. But if you look at what the short-term uh, markets have been pricing in for the funds rate, the federal funds rate, They've been wrong and re, you know repricing uh, constantly for the last year, and I think they're going to be wrong for a good while yet to come. So, if I can, let me break this down a little bit because just sure. going back to the the basic premise that inflation is too much money chasing too few goods, right? Right, just that that fundamental, yeah. yeah. Um, and understanding that 
you know, the, the Fed, when they had that money on their balance sheet, they're really, that money's going into treasury bonds, presumably, and that's how it's getting into the economy. When they raise interest rates, how is it coming out of the economy? So if you've got too much money and you're trying to reduce the amount of money, how does raising the rates, if you can just explain this for listeners, yeah. how does raising rates take money out of the economy? Well, two things. They're doing two things. I think you got to link them together. They're raising the rate and they're implementing QT, quantitative tightening. And QT means that essentially they're draining $95 billion a month uh, out of the financial markets. That is, their balance sheet is shrinking because as bonds mature, instead of uh, extending them, uh, you know, they mature and the Fed's balance sheet shrinks by that amount. So they're basically draining from the bond pits, supply and demand where bonds are priced, 95 uh, billion a month. And in my judgment, that is far more important in terms of the battle that they're trying to wage against inflation than just raising the rates. Now, on the other hand, as they raise rates, they make it more painful for borrowers who are on variable rates or short-term rates and have to uh, short-term loans and have to uh, uh, roll over uh, their position. They're making it more painful for people to keep that much debt outstanding. And there was a great piece recently in the Wall Street Journal about how big-time commercial real estate investors thought they were being very smart by funding their purchases of rising, you know, office uh, building values or um, mall <laughs> values on variable rate uh, loans, okay? And it didn't cost anything. I mean, it was practically a rounding error, but their lenders required them to buy rate caps. So right. in the unexpected event that rates went up, the cap would protect the lender. But these rate caps were short term. And as the rate caps now uh, expire and they have to roll over, roll them over, the cost of a one year rate cap to keep their uh, loan intact is 10 to 30 times higher than it was a year ago or yeah. two years ago. So what I'm saying is, th this is just one example, but the effect of it is going to force people to sell buildings, sell assets, reduce their loan position. And when the selling starts, that uh, contributes to the deflationary dynamic. Because uh, at that point, at that point, the loan's going away and you're taking the money out of the market. And when you, the loan's going away, you're taking the money out of the market, but also on the margin, the sales that will be made by people that are asset sales, that are being forced to liquidate their funding, their, their loans, will drive down average prices, which will discourage investors and speculators from starting new builds, from making new uh, investments. Uh, it's bad enough in the office sector already, or uh, you know, strip malls uh, and uh, much else of commercial real estate. But as uh, the liquidation of loans because of rapidly rising interest carry costs, uh, you know, uh, gather accelerates, the sales are going to accelerate, prices are going to fall, and economic activity in that sector will be curtailed. Now, that's just one sector. Commercial real estate, it's, it's you know, it's important, but it's uh, not the whole GDP. But the point is, this is illustrative of what happens when you reverse the easy money, uh, you know, debt dynamics of what we've had for the last 30 years. So so what do you see? So let's talk about this coming recession then that you're talking about. What do you see the tipping point is going to be to really plunge into that recession? And how deep do you see that recession going? Well, uh, I think it's very hard to predict exactly how deep, but I think it's pretty apparent that we went through an aberration with the COVID lockdowns and, uh, and the massive uh, COVID so-called uh, recovery uh, spending that occurred in uh, response. There was $6 trillion 
in three different bills uh, you know, from March uh, 20 to March 21. Now, uh, the effect of this was to totally unsettle the labor market, and it created a condition where millions of people left the labor market uh, because uh, they were getting all their STEMI checks. They were getting 600 a week on top of their regular unemployment. Uh, they were taking early retirement. They were suddenly finding they had corporal tunnel and got on disability, uh, food stamps, housing, the rest of it. But millions of people left the labor market. And as a result of that, P uh, employers suddenly found a much tighter situation in terms of filling uh, their current open uh, positions as well as expected open positions. And what I think happened over 2020 through 2022 was HR departments, especially in Silicon Valley and in the tech sector, began to hire uh, preemptively, <laughs> began to hoard labor because uh, they went through this trauma of not being able to hire when they needed. So what I think we have out there now is a tremendous excess inventory of labor, <laughs> uh, in, especially in the big companies and especially in the tech sector, but quite generally because uh, HR departments began to do this across the board. Uh, that suddenly they're going to start, uh, you know, uh, realizing that they've way overstocked their labor. They've way over hoarded. And they're going to begin uh, to reverse policy quite uh, unexpectedly and quite dramatically. Or maybe we had a recent example of that when Microsoft announced that they're going to lay off 10,000 people, which, you know, supposedly wasn't going to happen. And the same thing is true uh, with recent announcements by a lot of the other tech companies as well. So I think what we're going to get over the next few months, maybe this is what you're looking for as the uh, tipping point, is a sudden reversal of um, hiring practices, uh, especially among the Fortune 500 and uh, uh, layoff announcements, because they basically, um, you know, are stuck with unproductive uh, labor that's, you know, hitting their earnings. A good example of that recently was Salesforce. They laid off 10% of their workforce. That's a lot of, you know, 75,000 people. They laid off 10% of them uh, because essentially their earnings have been, uh, you know, uh, shellacked uh, by uh, the carry of excess labor. Everybody else is going to figure that out as well. And that's where it'll start. Then, once the layoffs start and we get some big uh, unemployment numbers, it, it'll begin to work its way through the psychology of the Main Street as well as the Wall Street economy. So the so the labor report's what we're looking for here, and that that that's that yeah. that's your indicator. So yeah, but not just I, I might say not just the monthly BLS because the BLS labor report uh, report is hardly worth the paper it's printed on. It's a lagging indicator. There's all kinds of Mickey Mouse shenanigans that go on in terms of how it's formulated. But if you look at the daily announcements of uh, layoffs and uh, uh, labor force uh, adjustments, uh, you, you can see it's beginning to happen already. And that's the thing to watch, not just uh, the monthly BLS. The BLS will catch up uh, with, a, with a lag. So uh, to stay ahead of the game, uh, it's important to remember that we're way over hired, we're way uh, over hoarded on the labor front, and that balloon or that bubble is about ready to bust. Okay, so the the subtitle of your book is "Protect Yourself from the Coming Inflation Storm." So, what are your recommendations for investors to protect themselves from what's coming? Well, I think twofold. One is the name of the game, after all, is net worth. That is the difference between your assets and liabilities, not just assets. And that the game going forward will be more to focus on the liabilities and reduction of liabilities because you're going to pay interest on those and the interest rates are going to be uh, continuing to climb, uh, I think, quite substantially as we've discussed, rather than the game of the last 30 years, which has been borrow cheap money, buy assets, 
and capture the difference between rapidly appreciating assets and um, cheap uh, liabilities. So the first thing, that's a big change. That's, that's an epical change. That is, you know, a, a, a change in the fundamentals to a liability reduction focus rather than an asset appreciation focus. The second thing is not to fall for the Wall Street story that the pivot is near, that the bottom is almost in, and now's the time to back up the truck, as Jim Cramer might say, uh, and buy these beaten up stocks. No, the, the, the stocks are not beaten up nearly enough. Uh, the market today is, uh, you know, at 38, uh, 39, uh, 100, the S&P 500, it's got a long way down to go uh, before we get back to some kind of sustainable PE uh, uh, ratio. So I got one final question for you. Sure. So shifting a little bit to the crypto market, yeah. which has seen very big increases in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, yeah. Do you see that also being a kind of a, a false indicator that that will yeah. also yeah. turn like the stock market will? Yeah, I think the crypto market, unfortunately, and I don't like government money and I'm uh, you know, a violent almost critic of the Fed. So when the crypto coins came along, I said, good, private money. That's uh, what we ultimately ought to go for. But the Fed has so corrupted the financial system with all this easy liquidity and all this easy, uh, low, you know, low interest rate uh, borrowing that the speculators simply said, oh, we like the crypto coins. It's just another asset class that we can dive into, borrow money, buy the asset, watch it go up and make another killing. And they wrecked the crypto market. Yeah. The crypto market now is just a um, dangerous subsidiary of Wall Street. Uh, and so as Wall Street has had a bit of a recovery since uh, December, uh, the crypto market has as well. But as soon as the Wall Street goes into its next uh, stock market uh, dive, the cryptos that go right with them. Got it. So the book is The Great Money Bubble, Protect Yourself from the Coming Inflation Storm. And uh, David, it's been a, a pleasure. Any final words for our listeners? Well, I think the best thing, the best final word is the game has changed. And so therefore everything that worked, uh, that seemed true, uh, that uh, you became accustomed to, over the last decade or three decades is now uh, inoperative. <laughs> We're in a new ball game and it's a dangerous one. And so people need to think about protecting their assets rather than speculating for higher uh, gains. Awesome. Thank you very much. So okay. uh, again, uh, David Stockman, uh, you can find him at davidstockmanscontracorner.com. I get that right. That's correct. That's and correct. Uh, the book, again, is The Great Money Bubble, Protect Yourself from the Coming Inflation Storm. Uh, this is just more financial education. We really do need to understand the kind of the macro version of what's right. going on if we're going to understand what we do in our own micro investing. And when we do that, we'll always make way more money and pay way less tax. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.